I swear I have better things to do, but I can't stop myself, dude, I gotta do some hacking. And we are back for some more, except we are going to be doing something completely different today. We are doing binary exploitation, that's right. Hello everybody, I'm Karar, and today we are going to be doing binary exploitation in Pico CTF. And look at that beautiful color door, we gotta do it. Okay, don't worry, I will get to my Yusufo and Yusufo videos soon, but I can't stop, dude, hacking is so fun. Now same as last time, I have done these problems before, like a really really long time ago. So I don't remember the solutions, and the main thing to get out of these problems is the concepts, okay? The concepts are super cool. Like even though the problems themselves aren't super complicated, the concept behind it teaches you how computers work, and it's super cool. So why don't we just get into it? I'm just gonna put 30 minutes on the clock, let's see how far we can get. 30 minutes. Okay, so we gotta go in here. So the first one is handy shell code. So basically, this program, uh, is this relevant? Okay, so it gives us a binary file, so we can't really read that right now. But basically, it executes any shell code you give it. Can you spawn a shell and use that sh uh, to read the flag.txt? You can find the program in here. Okay, so basically, it's giving us the program in the shell server, so we're going to have to open up shell, which we could do here. Let's make this boy full screen. Okay, we are into the shell. And then, basically, it says we could cd into this folder to find the, uh, to find the code. So we could do that. But dang it, why is Windows so bad? You had to do right click and paste so evil okay so now we're in the right folder ls and there we go there is our vault and basically we can look at the c program by just doing cat vault.c and look right here here's our program so basically what it does is it asks you to enter your shell code and then you put it in and then it executes it and we're good so basically what we need is shell code which is basically a bunch of bytes that gets translated into code and they run it in the shell and we need that to open a new shell within the shell so that we could access the files so basically there's one pretty easy way to do it so what we're going to be using is we're going to be using pawn tool so what we could do is we could in our home directory we could make a new uh, python file we'll call it like what's it shell.py and then we could do from pawn import what basically means from this library we're going to import everything that's in it and now we could try to get our shell right so basically you could do print and then we want to print our shell code so we do asm to get the right formatting on our shell code and then we had to actually get the shell code and pawn makes it really easy because basically pawn lets you just call linux dot shellcraft or something let's search it up pawn shellcode shellcraft okay so we can basically just do pawnlib dot shellcraft or wait, what? Wait, yeah, we could do uh, shellcraft amd64, and let's try this, python shell.py. Hold up, I did this wrong. I forgot how this works, let's see. Vim, okay, so how do we get shellcode? Another cool thing about CTF is that you had to learn on the spot, so that's nice. Let's see. Wait, we need a function for shellcraft create shell. Oh, the sh, there we go, that's how you do it. Okay, that is what we do. Dot sh, then we go here, and we go there. Hold up. Okay, nice, I guess. Wait, hold up. Oh, we had to convert it to ASM, otherwise it won't work. So, let's try it. We have to ASM it, so let's try it. ASM. Basically, it converts it to bytes, as you can see here. And then the bytes could run on the program, so we gotta do that. But there was some error here, I don't know what it was. Oh, can I literally just do shellcraft.ash? Do I need to specify? Wait, let's see. CTF, go all the way there, close this. Oh, that works. Okay, so we can pipe this into our thing dot slash vol but it doesn't keep the thing open so in order to keep it open we could do python and then that and then cat which will keep our terminal open dot slash vol okay and we can see everything we opened a, a shell inside the thing so cat flag dot txt very cool and we got it very nice so we'll copy this boy in paste it over here so basically to understand what happened there basically what happens is you take c code right and a machine can't run C code, so it has to convert it to assembly code, which is like, if we go up here, it's this stuff right here. This push, all these na random hex digits, all that stuff. This is called assembly code, and basically machines could run this. However, in order to pass it in to this, like, into dot slash vuln, right? If we do dot slash vuln, we had to pass it in a string, right? We type something out, and it executes that. Basically what ASM does is it assembles it, it converts it into bare minimum machine code that a machine could run just by reading through it. So in order to get our shell code from our assembly code, we call ASM on it, and we are Gucci. And basically all the shellcraft stuff was just part of Pawn, and it makes it really easy to make shell code. Whoops, I spent way too long on that one. Okay, practice run, let's see. So we already know how to run programs, you do the dot slash on the thing, so why don't we go to this folder and just run the program that is there. So we just go, close this, dot slash, or no, cd into this folder. Ah, oh, yeah, no, why is the Windows? Ah, oh, yeah, oh, god dang it, Windows. 
Okay, paste it in there. Well, I'll have to hear. And then it says run this. Don't slash, run this. And that's how you run something. Epic. Basically, this run this file is a binary. Like, it's the ASM code you saw. So, if we wanted to see exactly what it's doing, we could do obs jump dash d run this. And there you go, here's all your assembly code. Now, technically you could understand this code, but it's really nasty, and it's something called decompiler that converts it back to C. It's really cool stuff. But anyway, the point is that we are done with this problem basically after we run it. So, dot slash run this. Epic. Get ready to reverse. Rip, I just copied the entire directory instead of this. Okay, copy, paste, epic. <laughs> Bro, the storyline is so long, god dang it. I mean, I could, theoretically, just go to challenge column, but come on. The game is cool, dude. Look, look at these beautiful graphics. They're, they're actually pretty epic. Okay, so overflow zero. Overflow the correct buffer in this program and get a flat. So basically, let us go to this thing in the shell. CD that up, can't do control V. And now we're in here, LS, and you can see we've got a vuln and a vuln.c. So if we wanted to see what's going on here, we could just go to the C program. So cat vuln.c. Okay, so here's the C program. And basically what it's saying is it tries to open the flag. If the flag is not there, it says it's missing. So you're in the wrong place, okay. Then what it does is it reads the flag into this um, array, right? It's an array of carers, I'm assuming. Yeah, see, it's a care array. Okay. And then basically you're supposed to pass something into the arguments of the function. So basically when you run it, you have to pass in an argument and it'll print out what you passed in. However, it calls vuln on the thing you passed in and it goes into vuln and it tries to copy what you put in into this buffer. But the buffer only has 128 characters, so if you go past it, you could overwrite stuff that's after. But basically, let me show you how C memory works. I'm gonna pause the timer real quick. So basically, your memory looks like this. So you basically have a box, ah, that's not a box, a box of memory like this, right? Right? And basically, your memory addresses start from zero, and they go to some max address over here. And basically, whenever you allocate an array in the memory, it sets up a chunk of memory for you to put your array. So it'll put your first element at the bottom of the array, then it'll put your second element, then your third element, and so on. However, if you try to write into this array something that's bigger than it, it'll go past it, and that is called an overflow. So that'll create an error, and that'll let us get the flat. So let us run the program with a really, really long string that's longer than 128 characters, and we will get an overflow. So dot slash vuln, and then we can pass in our string. So it's really long, epic. Uh, I don't think that's 128, let's keep going, let's keep going. Very good stuff. We got the nice overflow, Pico CTS, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Okay, moving on. Aha, uh -huh. okay, now we can do overflow one. Why don't we try a slippery shell code? What is this? Actually, why don't we just do it in point order? That, that seems like a better idea. So you beat the first overflow challenge. Now overflow this buffer and change the return address to the flag function in this program. Okay, so let us copy this boy in. CD, right click, paste. <laughs> Dude, right click, paste is so lame compared to control V, god dang. LS and cat bone.c. Let's see what it is. Now you might be saying, why don't you just cat flag.txt? No siree, that can't do. Permission denied. This is so sad. God dang it. But anyway, so basically it opens the flag file. Oh, I should throw my timer again. So basically what happens is it opens your flag. It puts it into the buffer, which stores your flag. And then basically it goes to main. Or actually, and then the program starts in main though. So we haven't yet got into this function, so we can't print the flag yet. So basically it puts this out, it asks you for your input, it goes into vuln, and then it says get your input. And the reason why get is so bad is because it lets you overflow. So even if you go past the array, it still lets you make it. So you could write whatever you want, past the array. So now you might be saying, how the heck do you make it a return to a different place? Like shouldn't vuln return back here, right? And then this should return out and quit. Well, basically the way it works is, you probably know that there's something called a stack, right? So basically how memory works in C is you got like, your static memory somewhere over here, you got your stack over here. I'm not sure, I forgot where our static memory is, but basically you got your stack here, and you got a heap over here, and you got your code over there. So this stores all your code, and this right here is your heap for all your like allocated memory, but then your stack is for all your local variables. So you know, right, like if you ever wrote it, written a program, you can't access local variables outside. The reason that works is because every time you call a new function, what it does is it stores its return address, and then stores some other stuff about it, and then it starts storing the local variables on the stack. So it keeps adding, because the stack grows downward basically. So your local variable one would go here, then your local variable two would go there, and so on and so forth. And then when your function is done, it looks at the top, what was my return address? It returns back to that address over there, it erases all this memory, and then it starts from wherever it was told to return to. So in this case, right, our local variable is going to be this buffer array, right? So you got some buffer array, right? 
So this is buff, and then your um, you got some information over here, and then you got your return address over here. So essentially what we want to do is we want to overwrite the return address to something that we want to return to. So first why don't we just play around with this a little bit. So why don't we first make a Python file because I do not want to type 64 A's every single time. So what we could do is we could do python or no we could do bin uh, what will we call it overflow1.py. So using pawn we could really easily write stuff to vuln right. So basically what we could do is we could do import pawn as star or from pawn import star and then once we got that what we could do is we could say sh is equal to process and then we could do dot slash vault and then what we could do is we could tell sh.send line and we could basically tell it to send 64 a's let's say and then we want to receive what it tells us so rec v and we want to print that okay so let's try this python overflow one dot p1 so right now we didn't overflow the string right we gave it 64 a's that's perfectly filling the string and it said we're jumping to 848705. Why haven't we did like 63 strings, let's say, or uh, 63 A's? Then if we do 63 A's, then what happens is it's still jumping to the same thing because we didn't change it. We're still not going past our boundaries. But what happens if we go past our boundaries by a lot? So why don't we go like 100? Python, look at that. We changed the return address to 616161. And basically what that means is because an A has a value, a hex value of 61, it replaced the return address by only A because we literally, if you look at the diagram, we literally wrote A, 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 and you can see the return address got filled with A's as well. So now we need to figure out where do we want it to return to. And we also need to figure out where the heck our return address is. And the best way to do that is just to look at the assembly code. So if we do obdump d and then we do uh, vuln, we can see the assembly code and now we want to find the main function. So let us see. Okay, pro tip, if you want to figure out the main function really quick, you go obdump d and then vuln and then you go pipe it into the left and then you could do slash and then you could search for it. So, oh what? Oops, I spelled obdump wrong? God dang it. This is so sad. Okay, obdump. And then we can do slash main to search for it. And hooray, we found, okay, that's not the right main, n. Uh, oh, well, here it is, okay. Very good stuff. So your flag is here. So we want to eventually jump to this return address, right? We want to return to the flag function so it prints out our flag. And then here, over here is main. See, it highlighted it for us. And then now we can figure it out. So basically, the return address is pushed before it goes into the function. So the return address, let's draw the diagram for this. And let's erase all this. So we got our return address over here. And then as we go through it, it says it's pushing this register, which is basically how assembly stores variables. And we're pushing one thing. So that means we add something underneath our return address. Then we add another thing right here, the push EVX. And then we add another thing, push ECX. And then we subtract 10 from our stack pointer. And is that what we do? Oh, wait, wait, wait. No, no, no. We want to do it for vuln. We're looking, we're not, we don't want to do it for main. Vuln is the part that we want to exploit. So we once again have RA, and then now we look at what's pushed. So we first push EBP, then we push uh, EBX, and then we subtract 44 from the stack point. Well, okay, look over here. It's saying move ESP into EBP. So EBP is basically the top over here, right here. Because basically stack pointer points to the end, so after pushing EBP, the end of the stack is right here. So then it moves ESP into this, so EBP throws that. And then this right here says that we want to put what we read in into right here. So that's minus 48. So minus 48 bytes from here. So each of these things is four bytes, right? Like, you know, a long has 32 bits. That's four bytes. So we got four plus four plus 48. So that means that we got six or eight plus 48. So that's 56. So we want to write 52. And then we want to write four more, the stuff that we want exactly. So why don't we copy what we want so that we could put it into our script. So we want to put our return address as flag. Where is that? Okay, right here. So we'll copy this and let's queue. So queue to quit and now we can vim. Overflow1.py. Now technically you could do this just by guessing and checking until it... So you could just keep adding A's until it becomes like 61 and then 475 or whatever it used to be. But we are smart and we are not going to do that. Wait, no. 48 doesn't seem right. Wait, hold up, hold up. No, that's not right. Isn't it 64 though? Oh, oh, 48 in hex, what the heck? Well, we got to convert it into decimal, right? So 48 in hex is going to be 64 uh, plus 8, so that's 72. So this right here is negative 72. So this right here would be 76, and then the rest is going to be our RA. So what we could do is we could go over here to our thing. This should be replaced with 72. And then we want to add in our return address. 
So the way we could do it, if we could use something that Pawn gives us, is P32, which basically converts the return address we put in and puts it in the right order. So what we could do, we could just copy and paste it. Nope, not like that. Paste. Okay. And then to make sure it knows it's a hex, that we had to do 0x. Okay. And then we close this, and we should be good. So now we run this Python uh, overflow.py. Hold up. I think we are off by a little bit because we only changed the last one, so that's not right. So we are... Oh, oh, we need to go more to the right. So 72 is not enough. Wait, yeah, that's what I said. We had to do 76, I'm trolling. That's what I said, I didn't do it. Okay, okay. There we go. So basically, we found that it's 72 plus 4 because we had to account for this guy, and this is what we want to change, not this guy. Okay, so let's copy this in there, and we are Gucci. Okay, nice. How much time do we have? We have 57 seconds. I'm going to do one more because it's fun. Let's see. Okay, so we'll go with... Slippery shell code. Um, can you spawn a shell? Okay, let us see what it, we got. Okay, CD in here. Wait, can I do Control Shift B? Oh, Control Shift B works. So, bro. Okay, okay, that's good. We can do Control Shift B. Not as cool as Control V, but it works. And why don't we just close the timer because we are done with that? And let us see what we got. So dot uh CD. I mean LS first. Okay, and then uh, cat bomb dot C. Let us see what we <laughs> get it. Let us see what we got. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Bruh. Anyway, the point is enter your shellcode and it executes from a random location. Did that matter? Wait, why did that matter? Oh, so, it, oh, okay. So it's going to execute our shellcode from some random location, but we don't. That's bad, right? Okay, so basically in shellcode, there's also do nothing commands. So what we could do is we could put a bunch of do nothing commands from 0 to 256 so that, like, even if it starts at the wrong place, it'll still be just doing nothing. And then put the actual shellcode after that 256. So why don't we just do that? And it should work. Okay. So um, the do nothing command is just a bunch of zeros. So what we got to do is we got to... Let's just use our same thing. What do we have in our home directory? So we have a shell.py. So why don't we just use that again? And then what we could do is we could just add like a ton of zeros before that. So I... 0 or slash x 0 0 times like 300 plus that. So the reason why I did the slash x 0 0 is because that tells um, Python that it's a byte. So 0, the character, is actually like, I don't know, like 30 or something in ASCII. So if we want the actual 0, we actually had to put um, slash x 0 0. Yeah, so why don't we just cat this and put it in. So what we could do is we could do cat. Wait, why don't we, okay. So one thing I didn't know how to do before is to use pawn to run this interactively in programs, but there's a really cool way to use pawn, so why don't we try it this time? So we could do sh is equal to process and then dot slash volume, and then we could do sh dot send line this thing, and then after that we could do sh dot interactive, or why don't we do uh, print what it gives us back, sh dot recipe, and then after that we could um, sh dot interactive. Okay, so why don't we try that? Nice, we got it, perfect, good stuff. So we just cat the flag, and we got it. So why don't I just show you what happens if um, we didn't do that, if we didn't put the, all the zeros ahead of it. So we'll copy this first so we don't lose it. And then we could control C to quit out of that shell, and we could do ls of vim shell.py, and we could change this to like, let's just delete it. You wanna see a cool trick with vim, cta? Very cool, vim is actually kinda cool, okay. And then we could try it again, let's try Pythoning it, and see it doesn't work. Because what happened is that it like executed like half of our shell code, and that did not work. If you just start a C++ program from the middle, it just does, it, does, it doesn't make sense, it won't work. But anyway, we got our flag, let's put it in there. Very good stuff. Dude, hacking is actually so fun. Well, I mean, like not the fact that you're actually hacking stuff, it's the cool part is that you gotta learn all these cool things about computers, right? How memory works, like... How you can, how, it's like basically how, why programs could be vulnerable. But, anyways, I hope that was enjoyable. It was enjoyable for me. But thank you guys so much for watching. As always, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like and subscribe for more. Don't worry, I will get to my useful, useful, whatever videos you guys want. I will get to them. Thank you guys for watching so much again, though, and see you guys next time.